This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. In the name of our God who comes to us and visits his people. Amen. In the season of Advent, we are always mindful of not one, not two, but three comings of the Lord. The first, Bethlehem, which we're all very conscious of in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> the coming at the end of history, at the end of time, which has been the huge theme the last two or three Sundays, all kinds of issues about last things, the coming of Christ, judgment, the end of history, and so forth. But the one that perhaps practically really matters on a practical level is the coming of Jesus to you and me in that meantime between the first and the last coming. Now our gospel today directs our attention, zooms right down to earth from all those esoteric second coming things to real life and the real planet and real history. As the gospel open, <coughs> You heard seven different names mentioned of real people in history who actually lived, Lysanias and Tiberius and Herod and Pilate. By the way, we always mention Pontius Pilate in the Creed. You ever wondered why? Well, among other reasons, it takes us right down to earth and reminds us that this is all happening in real time in the real world you and I live in. These theologians call this sort of thing the scandal of particularity meaning that if God is going to come and visit his people, uh, he has to leave you know, the clouds or cyberspace or whatever is, wherever is God lives. In order to come to us, he has to take and pick a particular time and place and circumstance. He can't be everywhere. He's got to come somewhere. So it's Mary and Joseph. Why Mary and Joseph? I don't know. That's who he picked. He had to pick a region, Galilee, a country, Palestine, a city, Nazareth. Bethlehem. And when you deal with the specifics, then you have to deal with the specifics of those specifics in that context and with all its ups and downs and challenges and so forth. <clears throat> For example, if you marry someone, that means you have not married everybody else. And you have to live with the challenges and joys and all of the things that means to be married to that particular person. If you live in Palm Springs, that means you choose to not live anywhere else and must live with the realities, good and bad or whatever, about this place. Now, I know there's probably some snowbirds here, and some of you live in two cities, but it doesn't make any difference, so it's two cities. If you choose a particular vocation or career, that means you're going to live with and enjoy or be challenged by that career, and you're not going to get to do all kinds of other things. When I was in junior high and early high school, I thought I wanted to be a park ranger, a teacher, or a scout executive. You can see what happened to all of those plans. <laughs> Maybe I should have been a park ranger. <laughs> the scandal of particularity, it's got to happen somewhere, somehow, and you've got to deal with the specifics. And, you know, it's like the, the poor little old army colonel or corporal uh, who had worked on his Jeep out of the motor pool. He loved his Jeep. He took care of it. He maintained it. That was his job. And one day the Jeep just quit, crashed on the side of the road. He kicked it in the tire. It wouldn't start. It was finished. He knew he couldn't fix it. He was all upset and distressed, and an Army officer drove by and saw this soldier all upset and yelling at his Jeep. And he got out and said, Son, what's the matter? Sir, this Jeep is dead. I can't fix it. It's done. It's over with. We can't fix that. And the colonel says, Son, in this man's army, we got Jeeps all over the place. Go get another one in the motor pool. But sir, I like this Jeep. Or if you've ever been in any kind of, and many of you have, in any kind of romantic relationship where there was disappointment or breakup or hurt, and you felt you've been betrayed or lost or, or rejected, and you remember those feelings, and remember somebody came along and probably meaning well said something like, well, you know, there's a lot of fish in the sea. Do you remember how unhelpful that comment was? <laughs> I don't care about all those other fish in the sea. I cared about this fish. So that's what we're talking about here. The question then is, 
how in the most scandalous coming of Christ, the most particular of all, the one that really should get our attention is that Christ also comes particularly to you and to me. That's the one where it really hits the road. How do we prepare ourselves? How do we receive? How do we see this happening? How does Christ come to you and me in between those comings? Well, the tool that's alluded to in our gospel today is repentance. John arrives on the scene and announces a gospel of repentance and so forth. Clear the road, make crooked ways straight, level the hills, fill in the valleys. In other words, get the obstacles out of the way so God can come. And on an individual level, we have all kinds of obstacles that sometimes keep us from seeing the crisis just showed up in our face and we didn't know it. Repentance is the key tool here. And that means literally to turn around and go in a new direction. It does not necessarily mean that you have to beat yourself up, grovel in the dust, pour dust on your head, feel bad, or all of that stuff. Well, it might be appropriate depending on what. But it simply means to go in a new direction, to turn around. If you're eastbound on I-10 out of Palm Springs, you get off on the next off-ramp and you turn around and you head westbound. That's turning around. That's repentance going in a new direction. If you are drinking alcoholically and you're losing relationships or your job, then to repent means to stop drinking and to do all the things you need to do to maintain sobriety, going in a new direction. So the Greek word for this, and maybe that's more helpful because it doesn't have all kinds of associations, is metanoia. That's a Greek word that means turning around a new mind, a new way of seeing things, seeing things in a completely new way. That's what's necessary sometimes to see when God shows up right in front of you. I had a mentor that I liked very much, a bishop of the church, Mark Dyer. He died a few years ago. He was the bishop of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, not Palestine. Uh, I knew him briefly. He was a monk. Before he was a bishop, and particularly incredibly a spiritual man, and he once said at a conference I was at, he said, you know, if you're not living the kind of life that God wants you to live, and all the things that we read about in the scriptures and so forth, if you're not doing it, then it's not that when Jesus comes he's going to beat you with a four by four or send you to the charcoal fire for eternity, you're just going to miss it. You won't even notice, he'll pass right on by. You'll miss the coming of Jesus. It requires repentance and metanoia and a new mind. I have a personal example, which isn't anything dramatic, but I grew up having a real animosity toward physical work. I'm not good at it. I don't have those skills. And that's because in the Caffrey household, my mother would say to me, David, go out and help your dad. So I'd go outside and dad would be under the hood or, or messing with a barbecue. And I'd say, hey dad, I came out to help. And that was the end of that program because my dad, he did not have the skills or the DNA to know how to include, to help, or to teach. He didn't know how to scoop me in and teach me anything. So I stood there like a bump in a log and felt like an idiot. And all my growing up, I felt that way about physical labor. I felt very inadequate very unimportant and really, really uncomfortable. So naturally, as a parish priest, after I flunked being a park ranger, you know, a lot of churches have things called work days on Saturdays almost always because most churches don't have the money to hire the help they need to do all the stuff around the church. So it would be parish work days on Saturdays. And I managed to make sure I was always at another meeting those days. I hated those days. And you know, for the moment, I must say on behalf of my clergy colleagues who are present today, uh, I think I speak for them. There are several in the congregation as well. Saturdays are the worst day in the week for clergy because everything happens on Saturday. And that's because most people are off on weekends and we're not. But I used to avoid those things like the plague because I felt so inadequate and so uncomfortable. And then I went off on sabbatical leave Spent 10 days in a monastery, and the guest master came up to me the very first night and said, David, he says, uh, I hope you don't mind my asking this. Gosh, I really hate to ask. You just got here, but 
The guy who normally does the pots and pans after lunch and dinner is gone for two weeks. Would you mind, would you mind terribly doing the pots and pans after lunch and dinner? And I said, sure. And I can honestly tell you that's one of the most joyous things that ever happened in my life because I was no longer a visitor. I was a part of the community. I had something to contribute that I could do. I can do pots and pans. And I felt like I was valuable and a part of the community. And it was a whole new ball game. It was a metanoia for me. I saw physical work in an entirely new way that I'd never seen before. Years later, I would discover in the rule of St. Benedict, which is obvi- arguably one of the greatest documents of the Christian church, where St. Benedict says in the sixth century, the tools in the tool shed are as sacred as the vessels on the altar. And what that means is, is that if your job today is to rake the leaves, swab the deck, clean the walls, clean the bathroom, if that's your job today, that is just as sacred and holy as celebrating Mass or preaching the Gospel. He has redeemed work for all of us. And from that point on, when I got back from that sabbatical, I never missed another work day, ever. And I came to love it. Knowing I didn't have to be perfect, I didn't have to have a lot of skills. If all I could do was rake the leaves, that was good enough. Even if I didn't finish, at least I participated and did my part. So it's a matter of seeing things in an entirely new way. It's like the old Irish gentleman whose favorite dog died after 15 years, his buddy, his friend. You know, you've lost pets, you know what that's like. And he lost his best friend, his Irish setter. He was really depressed, went to his parish priest and said, Father, is it possible that we could have a little service? I know it sounds a little strange, but could we have some kind of a service for my dog? And the priest very patiently explained, uh, we, we don't do funerals for dogs. I'm so sorry. Ah, Father, but he was so... You couldn't make an exception, Father. He says, Son, I'm sorry. We just don't have that in the ritual. It's not... We don't do funerals for animals, baby. Well, you might try that church down the street on Broadway Avenue. They're new, and I don't know. You might try to do something with another church, see what you can find out. And the Irishman nodded his head, started to walk out the door, turned and said, Well, Father, do you think... Do you think $50,000 would be an adequate donation for something strange like that? And the priest looked at him and said, why didn't you tell me that was a Catholic dog? (laughs) It's all how you see it. That's what we call metanoia. Metanoia. To have a new mind to see where Christ can be seen, where maybe you couldn't see him before. So here's a few examples. What do you see when you see church? Do you see organization, building, program, clergy, laity, annual meeting, budgets? Or do you see a living organism, the body of Christ, where Christ is not only encountered, but we meet the risen Lord in the breaking of the bread? What do you see when you see church? Do you need to have some metanoia? What do you see when you think about people who live in other countries, especially poor ones, who want to come and live in our country? What do you see? Do you see migrants, visitors, intruders, invaders, criminals, logistics? Do you see living persons who are scared to death, and have no home, and in whom the image of God dwells, and Christ dwells in them. What do you see? If you worked in the health field, the the medical field, what do you see? Do you see the cancer patient in 27, the stomach case in 29, the diabetic up on the fourth floor? Or do you see living persons, patients, scared to death, in whom Christ dwells and who are in the image of God. What do you see? If you grew up with an emotionally distant mother or an abusive and uncaring father, what do you see when someone says God is like a loving father? You'll need metanoia, perhaps with the help of a pastor, 
an uncle, an aunt, a church member, a counselor, to be able to see in a new way that God could be like a loving parent. About a month ago, there was an incident on the United Airlines flight in which a gentleman had a medical crisis on the flight and a young physician went to assist that person on the airplane. And the crew was very skeptical and negative and resistant, not believing this person really was a doctor, even though that person held up a medical license that said physician. They had their license with them. The reason they couldn't see that person as a doctor was because A, they were young, two, it was a woman, and three, it was an African-American woman. And that crew couldn't believe, because of their lack of metanoia, that such a person could actually be a doctor and help somebody in a medical crisis, even after she held up her medical license. Now, the happy ending of that is that United Airlines apologized later for that incident. Even an airline can have metanoia and see things in a new way. The point being that if I can see Christ appearing in others or in you, then perhaps I can also imagine that Christ might appear to me, even me. And so if I cannot see or experience or be aware of Christ in me, those other comings are lovely, but they're rather academic, aren't they? But if I can see, experience, because I'm able to see, that Christ can appear to me, to David, particularly David, or particularly you, ah, then those other comings begin to make some sense. And then I can believe and proclaim that of, cro of course Christ will come again because he's already come, and even particularly to me and to you. Amen.